Okay. Uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting me out here. I think the last time I was in this building, it was the Commerce Building, and I think it was 48 years ago. And uh, Dow Chemical was recruiting in this building, and uh, students were demonstrating, and they uh, eventually got them out of the building by flooding the place with tear gas. And the, the tear gas was my introduction to uh, Madison at the time. I'm planning to come here every 48 years. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this question of American decline, and I'm going to try to watch, look at my watch so I don't talk too long, because I, I really like to leave a lot of time for discussions. I always find it easier to talk if I actually know where, where people are at and which part of, parts of what I say give them uh, problems. Uh, the elite is always concerned with this question of American decline and uh, how do you reproduce American power. And for the left, this question is about how do you assess the lay of the land so you know the scale and scope of what you're up against if you're trying to change things. And for the left, this has always been a very ideological issue in the sense that uh, the left has always assumed that uh, if you can show that America is in decline, then uh, that somehow will encourage people uh, to struggle, to change things, it'll delegitimate the empire, it'll mobilize people. And so there's always an argument uh, for American decline. If one is disproved, people just move on to another one. When I was here in the 60s, the main argument was very much about the fact that America was in decline because there were liberation movements that were looking to get out of capitalism. Uh, there was a lot of nationalizations, especially in the 60s, in various countries. Um, and of course, there was Vietnam. Uh, by the early 70s, the argument was very much about economics, that there was a profit squeeze, uh, there was a crisis in, in the U.S. Uh, in the dollar, and that this was the foundation for expecting decline. Uh, by the early 80s, the, discussion, the, the reasons for decline had to do with Japan. Japan was going to overtake the U.S., uh, then Asia. By the 90s, it was Europe with European integration. Uh, by, by the millennium, it was China and the BRICS. And then there was the great financial crisis. And the first thing I want to say about all of this is that if America is in decline, uh, it's not necessarily good news in terms of making it easier to transform society. There's no direct relationship between America being in decline and uh, the rise of any kind of a left. It depends on uh, whether the left is organized, depends on the strength of the labor movement. After the crises of the 70s, uh, the labor movement was in fact very much weakened through the 80s and 90s. Uh, after the crisis, after the great financial crisis, in 2008, uh, people might have expected that this was a perfect time uh, to attack capitalism, to attack U.S. capitalism, to attack finance. In fact, it's the labor movement that's on the defensive again. Uh, what crises often do is uh, they not only weaken people because they feel more insecure, but they also tend to lower expectations. Uh, people begin to think that uh, Five years ago, before this crisis, things were wonderful. So when the, great, when the financial crisis hits, uh, for a lot of people, Bush looks good, and they're looking to, how do we get back to what we had just a few years ago? For workers, it's also a concern, the uncertainty, and what's happening to people leads to thinking in terms of, how do we fix things? And it ends up to be a, a conservative demand to fix things and to give up something in order to fix things, to accept and tolerate certain changes to fix things just to get some stability again. Now, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, when I go through the examples of uh, people always finding a reason for American decline, that it isn't in decline now. That, that's an empirical question uh, that we have to investigate. How do we assess what the state of the U.S. is today? Uh, and what I want to emphasize above all is that in looking at numbers, and you have to look at numbers to get at this, you have to have some kind of a framework, some kind of a theoretical <coughs> framework that makes sense out of those numbers. And 
I want to emphasize three or four things that I think are crucial when you look at those numbers. The first thing is to understand the US, the American state, as an empire. So that we're, we're talking about a state of a different kind. We can't assess numbers that are applied to the US in the same way that we, apply, you know, that we assess them if we're looking at uh, Canada uh, or even Germany or France. We have to be conscious of the fact that this is an empire that we're looking at uh, and that the US is central to global capitalism and the numbers therefore have different nuances. I, I'm going to elaborate on all of these. I just want to flag them first of all. The second thing, and it's related to the question of empire, is that we're looking at these numbers in the context of globalization. A lot of the ways we measure things, accounting systems uh, that were developed in the 30s and since then, were measures to develop how national economies do. And when you've got globalization, you've, you have to put into consideration, well, what is happening more broadly? How do multinational corporations and the existence of multinational corporations affect what, these, what this data means. A third thing is that you can try to assess things at a, at a point in time, but the real question of American strength isn't the capacities it has at a moment in time, but the dynamic capacities it has. In other words, the capacities to change. The capacities for the state to change and to adjust, the capacities within the economy to adjust. And the fourth thing that I want to stress is that I'm not talking about uh, you know, whether America is fine in terms of what it's offering working people. I'm talking about whether it's strong in terms of capital accumulation, in terms of the measures that we use to address capitalist societies, their ability, their, their profitability, their ability to, to expand. But when we're looking at these numbers, we especially have to look at the question of class and the strength or weakness of the working class, because that either constrains capital or leaves them uh, space to change. Okay. When I say empire, when I started with emphasizing empire, and what's different, so different about the United States, is that the US imperial project is about superintending the making of a liberal global order. It's not just about what is good for the United States. It's about creating a global capitalism. Marx talked about the making of a global capitalism back in the manifesto. But you don't really see the making of a fully global capitalism until the last two decades of the 1900s. Now, what's unique about this, this kind of an empire is, is that it's a specifically capitalist empire. It's not just an empire that is taking over other territories by force. It's a, it's a specifically capitalist empire in two senses. One is that it's trying to create this world and manage this world through markets, through the importance of something that is less direct. Markets, which seem voluntary rather than direct force. The second thing is that uh, it's doing this in the context of sovereign states and encouraging the development of sovereign states, not just of taking over and running other states. So the role of the military in supporting this is in fact critical because the military plays a vital role in establishing certain conditions, certain class relations, certain institutions, or defending certain institutions and class relations. And sometimes just being an empire like police forces, uh, a lot of what you're dealing with is the mess that is created in society. Uh, and so the, the, the military is also important just in terms of trying to establish some basic work. But the main thing I want to emphasize is the importance of the American empire in trying to create a world which is capitalist and which operates through the discipline of markets and which operates through sovereign states that states don't disappear with globalization. Now the development of this, uh, which was something that Britain couldn't contain as Britain rose to power, it was capitalist in certain ways, but it couldn't integrate other capitalists into the same project, 
this is a historical development. It's not just something that was there in the American character. America, the United States might have acted in, uh, as a regional political force historically uh, by the 20s. By the end of the First World War, the US was already a dominant uh, industrial power and in a lot of ways the dominant financial power in the world, but it didn't take on the project in the 20s or 30s of acting on behalf of the making of a global capitalism for all of capital. That just emerged through the 30s and 40s as on the one hand, the US began to recognize and appreciate the cost of a capitalism that would be a target, as with Germany, of capitalisms that became national in their dimensions and closed off uh, their markets uh, to the US that was critical for the expansion of American capital and critical to have a certain kind of peace within that. It was absolutely critical that you create an open world order. And the second dimension of this wasn't just that there was an interest in doing this that they learned, but they had the capacity to do this. They had the capacity to do this because of certain developments uh, in the American state as it expanded through the 40s, 30s and 40s and took on uh, new initiatives. And it had the capacity because of how it came out uh, after the Second World War in terms of its relative strength to everybody else. So this was at first an empire that was bringing the former empires into one empire. It was integrating and essentially moving to end the other empires as autonomous empires. Uh, and then over time, this spreads to the much more complex question of how do you integrate the third world, the global south, when certain kinds of social relations and certain kinds of uh, states didn't exist yet. So that's this point about the empire. Now how this affects how we measure the question of decline uh, here are some examples. Uh, when you look at the United States in, in the, uh, after the Second World War in the early 50s, it's got somewhere between 40 to 50 percent of industrial production is in the U.S. When you look at it in the 70s, it's down to, early 70s, it's down to about 25 percent. Well, if you just look at that, you would say, well, America's declining. It used to have all this industrial production now. A large uh, part of that is in other parts of the world. If you measure this in terms of empire, if you measure this there in terms of the, the project was to spread capitalism throughout the globe and create new opportunities for American capital, then you understand this as a success, not as a failure. The fact that they could spread capitalism to Europe, to Japan, to the, to the global south was a success. The fact that the US had a smaller share of this wasn't a measure of failure, but it was now a smaller share of something much larger and something that was integrating different countries. When you look at the US in terms of the trade imbalances it had, especially in the 80s and 90s, it looks like, well, it's in decline. It's importing more than it's exporting. When you break that down, first of all, you find out that it actually is exporting a lot. It was actually, its exports were actually growing faster than Europe, uh, pretty close to Japan's. It was exporting a lot, but it was importing even more. And if anybody else did that, they would have a problem. They'd have a deficit problem. There'd be a question of how to pay for it. For the US, this wasn't a problem because of the role of the dollar. Uh, anybody who uh, had a surplus with the US was reinvesting that money in the US. So what it really meant was that the US had access to global labor. It had access to all these goods being made around the world cheaply. So for American capital and for the US, having a deficit in itself wasn't a problem because of the role of the dollar. Uh, the same goes with the financial deficit. The fact that the, all this money was flowing into the US and the US had to pay interest on it, for other countries this might be a problem. For the US it wasn't a problem because of the role of the dollar. And so the US is able to both uh, wage wars abroad, invest foreign, uh, multi American multinationals are able to invest abroad, American consumers were consuming a fortune, uh, largely through debt, and is able to do this without an international constraint because of the power of the dollar and the power of the U.S. in the world. Now the power of the dollar isn't just this privilege that it happens to be that the U.S. has a dollar. The dollar gives the U.S. this privilege because the U.S. had the capacity uh, to 
demonstrate that it had discipline, that you could trust putting your dollar in the U.S. because it would control inflation, because you didn't have to worry about property rights and it being nationalized, because you didn't have to worry about a strong American labor movement, either uh, putting constraints on that or creating inflation and therefore eroding your money. So the fact that the U.S. was able to have this discipline in its own social formation and because it has such deep financial markets means that it has the privilege of having the dollar. Another dimension of this relates to empire and globalization together. Let me just take a drink. Uh, if you look at national accounts and you begin to look at things like deficits and everything else uh, and what's happening in the United States, what you miss is what American multinationals are doing. What you miss is the incredible expansion of American multinationals as part of the American empire abroad. So if you looked at the Fortune 2000 and you look at it by sector, you go through sector by sector. One of our students uh, uh, did a paper on this, which is in uh, New Left Review. Uh, if, you take, if you take 25 sectors, if you divide global economy into 25 key sectors, in 18 of them, the U.S. still clearly dominates. It's measured by percentage of assets, percentage of value added, as percentage of profits. In 18 out of those 25, it's the U.S. that dominates, and uh, generally it's in the higher tech sectors. Uh, and uh, the, the other seven are uh, divided amongst other countries, with China growing quickly, but nobody else coming close. So let me just read an, a few more, some more data without boring you with a lot of numbers. Um, and th this is about the strategic importance of the U.S. Uh, the U.S. accounted for between 60 and 75 percent of all OECD research, that's basically the developed countries, research and development expenditures in high-tech sectors like aerospace and scientific instruments. About uh, half of the OECD research and development in electronics and pharmaceuticals. In office equipment and computers, it only had about 40 percent, but uh, Japan was second with about 12 percent. Uh, as of uh, going into the last crisis, the top three or four global firms uh, were American in such diverse sectors as technological hardware and equipment, software and computers, aerospace, military, and oil equipment and services. 14 of the 16 top global firms in healthcare equipment and services. Four of the top five corporations in global media two of the top three in pharmaceuticals, industrial transportation, industrial equipment, and fixed-line telecommunication sectors, and five of the top six corporations in general uh, retail. Uh, nine of the top ten corporations in global finance services were American. So the point is you have to look at not just what is happening within the United States, you have to take a look at the dominance of American corporations. Okay, so what about this question of the material base of empire? You can't have an empire unless you actually have a strong material base. Uh, it's needed so you can support the military, it's needed so that other countries have confidence in your future strength that they're going to invest in. And if you take a look at, uh, after the 70s there was a lot of talk, uh, Robert Brenner wrote a famous piece about uh, the profitability crisis and uh, the mess that the United States was in and that capitalism was in after the 70s. But the point is that capitalism restructured. It destroyed labor and then it restructured through the 80s and 90s, especially, it still is restructured. It demonstrated a dynamic capacity to adjust and that was led by the United States. The 80s and 90s were probably the most dramatic period in the making of global capitalism in capitalism's history. It's a period in which the uh, liberation movements in the South were either destroyed or they were integrated. By the mid-70s, nationalizations in the Global South essentially stopped. Uh, nobody was looking to leave capitalism. Uh, even Vietnam, I think Time had a cover story on Vietnam in the early 80s which said something like, U.S. lost the war, uh, but capitalism won. Vietnam was trying to get into capitalism. Uh, about 30% of the world in the 50s was standing was outside of capitalism, primarily in the communist countries. Uh, through those two decades, communist countries were integrated uh, into capitalism. Uh, within capitalism, 
there was a profound deepening of capitalism through privatizations, through the restructuring of the state, through uh, the erosion of any social programs that challenge capitalism in any way. Uh, what was going on in the United States over this period was devastating to a lot of working people and communities, but what was going on wasn't hollowing out of American capitalism. What was going on was a restructuring. There was a restructuring of, of workplaces, there was a restructuring of industries in terms of some industries did disappear, like textiles, uh, but other industries were expanding, like the high-tech strategic sectors. So there's a period of all kinds of new technologies being introduced. There's a period of finance coming to play, a, a new role in terms of discipline. Uh, it's uh, an incredible restoration of profits, uh, issues of freer trade that people had fought against and of capital flows continued. They weren't interrupted. Capitalism continued to, de to develop. And all of this was tied to labor's defeat, which I'll come back to. So if we did a snapshot of capitalism today, and we said, okay, what's the material base of capitalism? There's four points I'd want to emphasize. One is that if you look at tr in traditional sectors, some have disappeared, but if you're looking at traditional sectors like the iconic auto industry, and you hear a lot of talk about the destruction of uh, the big three, in auto it's restructuring. Auto is getting enormous investments from the Germans, the Koreans, and the Japanese. Uh, the auto industry is expanding in the US. It's expanding in the South, which is part of this restructuring. Uh, the critical point is that the unions have been unable to unionize these places. It's an organizing question, not a question of this industry disappearing and therefore we, can, we can't do anything about it. Uh, uh, and, and the reason that they're coming is because it's still the richest market in the world because they're nervous in some cases about the U.S. ever introducing any kind of protectionism and they want to be inside. They're coming to get access to American research and development and marketing skills. So that's one thing, that even those sectors which a lot of people write off, it's not very accurate. Second of all, if you do look at high-tech manufacturing, uh, the U.S. has shown uh, an ability to move into the high-tech sectors, in, whether you're talking about aerospace, pharmaceuticals, uh, computers, computer software, the U.S. is still leading. That leadership role has, has been maintained. Nanotechnology, chemicals, and a lot of this is directly related to the state. Uh, if you look at the kind of developments that go on within the United States, the U.S. spends more on healthcare than anybody else in the industry, in the world, but part of that is a cost to certain companies. Part of that has actually been about sustaining a particular industry in terms of nanotechnology, biotechnology, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, the, uh, in, in sectors like electronics and chemicals, uh, it's the U.S. military, aerospace. It's the defense industries that have been a major foundation for the development of these high-tech sectors. Uh, American universities still play this crucial role. In fact, they're increasingly more and more linked to business in terms of playing that role, in terms of uh, reproducing that kind of uh, strength. The third thing I want to emphasize is that uh, we sometimes uh, think that something is only material if you drop it on your toe and it hurts. Uh, what's material in the economy is very much services as well. And the US, in terms of a global economy, is at the pyramid of a whole bunch of things that matter very much and give it a lot of power. And that has to do with service, uh, business services. Business services now employ more people than all of manufacturing. Uh, business services are a sector that the US particularly dominates. When I say business services, I'm talking about uh, management, uh, accounting, uh, engineering, legal, uh, and especially consulting. The other thing is uh, finance, of course, the U.S. really dominates, and people uh, sometimes see finance as operating against uh, industry, as finance being a drain on the economy. It's a drain, but it's not, it's not a drain in capitalist terms. It's drain, it might be a drain on people. So the role of finance has been, uh, in terms of derivatives, to be mechanisms which basically are about providing insurance 
for companies who face risks in terms of exchange rates or political risks abroad. So financial derivatives have actually played a role in limiting risks so that companies can increase uh, their extent, the extent of globalization. So they can globalize with, and, and have some protection against prices rising or exchange rates fluctuating or interest rates fluctuating. Uh, finance has accelerated the reallocation of capital, which has been part of this massive restructuring, whether you're looking across industries or, or into the American South. It's been part of developing venture capital, which has gone hand in hand with commercializing research and development. It's given the U.S. access to global savings. The U.S. has access to global savings in a way that allows them to do all of these things and to do it at lower rates. And above all, finance has been critical to imposing discipline uh, on companies. If they don't earn enough profit on governments if they think that they're, uh, if they don't like what they're doing in terms of their deficits. Uh, the next thing I want to emphasize in thinking about how we think about decline is we have to not just think about this economistically. We have to put this in the question of state capacities. The question of decline has to revolve around, is the American state in decline? I'll get, I'll get to some of the contradictions in a second. But one of the crucial things that we've seen in terms of both the last crisis and the development of capitalism over the last 20 or 30 years is the capacity of the American state to contain crises, not to prevent them. They don't think they can prevent them under capitalism, but to contain them so that they don't get out of hand, uh, so they don't interrupt free trade. So we get through this amazing crisis, which a lot of people would have thought, boy, everyone's going to be at each other's throats under capitalism. There was no break in free trade. There was no break in free capital flows. Uh, for all the talk about you can't get the state involved, the American state got massively involved, to some extent in uh, certain kinds of stimulus, but especially in terms of quantitative easing and managing the financial, uh, the financial crisis. Um, so the, the U.S. has remained absolutely central to the development of capitalism through this crisis. It remains at the center. Okay. Well, what about the rise of new powers? of new hegemons, uh, people who are going to challenge capitalism. And this was a fundamental dimension of Marxist theories of imperialism, that capitalism develops unevenly and that there will always be new powers emerging who aren't comfortable with the existing status quo and will challenge each other as and you would have wars as you did after the First World War. This is a different kind of capitalism. What's happened since the Second World War has been the integration of the former empires into a single empire. They're completely mutually interdependent. They may fight over things on the margins. There may be tensions between them. They may argue about exactly how free trade should be implemented. But none of them are challenging the dominant position of the US. So, so, so just a few quick examples. Um, uh, a while ago, Brazil. Uh, was leading opposition in the free trade talks against the U.S. around sugar. And this was presented as, here's a challenge from a growing power in the global south challenging the U.S. But the content of what they were raising was we want the U.S. to open up its markets to our sugar. What they were saying is we want to be more integrated into global capitalism. What they weren't doing was, uh, you know, was saying we want to restructure our agriculture so we stop having these multinationals who are concerned with how do we export things to the north, but actually feed our people. This wasn't what Brazil was saying. What Brazil was talking about was actually getting integrated into global capitalism, but you know, on certain terms, given that they're growing, they're growing power. Um, when you hear talk about the BRICS, there is no such thing as the BRICS in terms of any kind of a coherent force. Uh, Russia has nothing in common with South Africa. You know, these are, these, you know, <coughs> India, China, you know, these are either competing with each other or don't trust each other. There's no particular force there. Brazil now has its own problems. India is nowhere near a point of challenging anybody. Uh, Russia is involved in 
a regional confrontation, but it, is, it remains regional. Uh, China is the only one to take seriously here. And I think if you look at China, what is so striking is China is more integrated into global capitalism than any country has ever been uh, that was developing ever in history. It's dependent on global capitalism and very much on the US for markets, for technology that it accesses through multinational corporations. It doesn't want, it to, it doesn't want the burden of being the leading force. It doesn't want to have to cope with what's going on in the Middle, in the Middle East. Uh, it, its interests are in the US creating a world that is stable enough for China to reproduce itself. And the Communist Party is very much worried about instability within China. It has to grow in order to reproduce itself as an undemocratic uh, government and state. Uh, it can't liberalize finance, because if it liberalized finance so that it could challenge, to challenge the US in terms of the US dollar, you'd have to have the Chinese currency playing the role of a world currency. You'd have to completely liberalize it. They'll never do it, because this is central to their control over the economy. It's central to the Communist Party's control. China has the contradictions of the environment to, to deal with. It's got the contradictions of a rising labor movement to deal with. Uh, it's got the question of, China invests more. It's the only country that is even close to this. It invests more than people consume. Uh, I think the level of consumption in China is usually around 45 to 50 percent. The rest of the world, it's closer to 15 to 20 percent is investment. The rest is consumption. For China to shift from its incredible dependence on uh, investing in infrastructure and to shift to any degree away from its dependence on international markets, it would mean a dramatic shift in consumption within China, and that couldn't happen without a much stronger labor movement that would also pose a threat. So I think the way to understand China is that what China is doing is it's saying we're a rising power and we want to change our place in the pecking order. It's not challenging the US, it's not challenging global capitalism, but it is asking for being more respected within global capitalism and being involved in the decisions that are made. So, so most recently, you've probably uh, heard about uh, this creation of uh, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Board, uh, which most of the capitalist countries, well, capitalist countries, most of the world is accepted and uh, joined. China is the main funder. Uh, the U.S. has abstained from it. So the question is, well, what does that mean? Isn't this a challenge? What's, what's going on is that there's the IMF and the World Bank, which have played a mediocre role, even from the perspective of capitalism. And American Congress has, in particular, been a barrier here. They've been very reluctant to give the World Bank and the IMF any more money because they don't absolutely control it not because it actually threatens them, but because they don't absolutely control them. Um, that's led to China and uh, other Asian countries uh, and other countries in the world deciding to form a new institution. Now the point about this new institution is it isn't going to challenge capitalism. It's going to try to operate on the same rules as the IMF or the World Bank, but be a little bit more liberal, and especially to start addressing infrastructure in Asia. There's enormous needs for infrastructure in Asia. China's been developing its infrastructure. There's enormous needs across Asia. And this could actually be a, a great boon for capitalism at a moment when capitalism is stumbling a bit coming out of this financial crisis. Growth is still relatively slow. And other countries want to get in because they see all kinds of pluses in terms of their corporations uh, doing business around this infrastructure. The U.S. has been slow because it takes away their absolute authority, but I'm convinced that the U.S. will slowly find a way of getting involved because it is, it is not a threat except in the sense of absolute power. So let me just conclude with uh, a number of points and then we can get into a discussion. The, the first thing I just want to say is that this question of making global capitalism is incredibly complex. I mean, you know, the idea of creating a world that is going to be run uh, in terms of maximizing profits and corporations having the freedom to go where they want, of incredible inequality, of all these uncertainties, uh, is difficult. So we don't know whether there's going to be more crises or how this is going to develop. 
I'm, I'm not trying to predict the future. I'm trying to assess based on what we see right now uh, where things are going, and I don't see, I see all kinds of uncertainty, but I don't see any kind of a fundamental change. There are all kinds of contradictions in the making of global capitalism. Let me just list a few of them. Uh, you're obviously going to have some tensions when you have sovereign states. As long as you don't just have one state that says this is the way that it's going to be, but it's trying to integrate them so it happens through other states, you're going to have some tensions. And there's always, for example, been tensions with Germany about the U.S. arguing that they should do things a certain way. Well, it creates some tensions, but it hasn't led to any collapse. Right now, the U.S. is critical of Germany for not being a little bit more liberal in terms of what's happening in Greece. Uh, the U.S. is on the left of Germany on this. Uh, but those are tensions we shouldn't exaggerate when we see them. And there are going to be failed states, which create a problem for capitalism, because they can't do all the things that capitalists need in terms of stability and creating a pro proper environment. So you have this problem of how to deal with so-called failed states. That's one kind of a contradiction. The other contradiction is capitalism now depends more on finance than it ever did before, and finance is inherently volatile. It's not like a factory which it takes some time to close or to move. Finance can move so easily. So, you, so capitalism is now more volatile than ever before. So it's going to be a very volatile capitalism. A third thing is that people in the 80s and 90s used to talk about the imbalances in terms of the US importing too much, and the US taking too much of the world's uh, capital. Now the imbalances that they talk about are Europe uh, and the global south, and even China right now. If anyone's worried about anything right now, they're not so much worried about the US. They're actually worried about what's happening in Europe, uh, which could get messy. They're worried about the slowdown in China. And they're worried about the impact of fluctuating currencies in the US, fluctuating values of the dollar on countries like Brazil. Uh, another uh, contradiction is that the American state is both acts as both the state of global capitalism, but it's still a state of its own social formation. It still has to deal with uh, reproducing the, kind of the conditions within its own social formation for managing global capitalism. And that has been a problem in terms of Congress. Congress keeps raising things that get in the way of the US carrying out that global role. Now, so far, uh, when Congress raises this and they won't pass a budget or they won't give enough money to the IMF, or they wouldn't bail out Mexico at one point in time, or then they wouldn't bail out the Asian countries. Uh, whenever that's happened, Congress has eventually backed down. It's gone to the brink, and it's backed down. It's almost as if uh, when you get to the international dimensions, there's a certain bipartisanship about reproducing the American order. And the final contradiction I want to raise is the contradiction of the defeat of labor. It's meant that uh, corporations are you know, they're overflowing with cash, but they're reluctant to invest it because they're not sure what's going to happen with markets, because they're waiting to see what's going to happen with labor. So some of this is improved as people are as they've been hiring, but wages are still flat. So this point about austerity still raises this potential contradiction. The banks want austerity because they want to make sure that any money that they lend to governments will not be risked in terms of governments not being able to pay or in terms of inflation suddenly exploding. So the banks have been very conservative, emphasizing austerity. Workers haven't had the income to spend. Business has been waiting. Uh, eventually, I think they're going to be competing with each other and start moving in. We don't know. But the question of austerity right now is also uh, uh, a contradiction in the sense of affecting how fast or how slow growth will be. But it's not a contradiction in terms of undermining the centrality of the United States and the world of, under, uh, of uh, ending capitalism. So the point of all of this, the point that I'm trying to emphasize is anybody who is trying to think through what do we face? How do we have to prepare ourselves? How do we have to organize? How do we have to take the time, the long time, to develop something that can challenge American capitalism is that we have to recognize that we're, what we're facing isn't a weak capitalism, but a strong one. And I don't just mean militarily. I mean a capitalism that can still uh, make adjustments, that has still integrated people 
even ideologically, as unhappy as people are with what's been happening in their lives, uh, they don't think that there's an alternative. And that's what's legitimating the system right now. There's no alternative. As unhappy as people are, they survive. People figure out how to survive. And they survive by working longer hours, by taking two jobs, by living at home uh, a lot longer, uh, by getting married and still living at home, so you can save for uh, a mortgage, by seeing your house as an asset, which was happening before the latest crisis. That's what's going to give you some uh, income in retirement, uh, by hoping stock market goes up because that'll help your pensions. Those are all individual ways of surviving. And all those individual ways of surviving have nothing to do with building the collective capacities. In fact, they're a detriment to building the collective capacities to actually change the system. Because when you do that as an individual, you're more worried about things like tax breaks than being out in the street to challenge your corporations or to challenge the state. So what we have to understand is that it's not just that, li that workers and unions have been attacked, but they've been fragmented, weakened, their institutions have been uh, severely damaged, they've been <coughs> integrated. Um, and as long as the working class isn't in any doesn't have the potential to actually act as a barrier to what's going on, what it means is that capital and the capitalist state are left with the state, with the space to change, to recover, to innovate, to come up with something different. Uh, j just as a very quick example, and then there. Imagine if uh, the working class, when the financial crisis hit, said, well, there's no way that you're going to give that money to the banks. You can't do that. Just take them over, and we should just own them, and we should start using them for what we need. Well, this would have been a different ballgame. Uh, suppose the workers said, you're giving all that money to them, we're going to demand it in wages. Well, if wages would have gone up, they would have raised interest rates. Raising interest rates in the middle of that financial crisis would have meant a complete devastation and a crisis like the 30s. Um, so, you know, the working class is central to this. And when I say the working class, the final thing point is, I, I say that with a lot of humility, because the weakness of the working class has a lot to do with the absence of the left and the failure of my own generation to build a left. And saying that, I also think that the present generation hasn't been that great about doing it either. And that, I'll stop there. So, uh, questions, <laughs> comments, we be very happy to hear people completely disagree and challenge this. Um, who's, who's interested, so, sir? Sorry, who's, who's going to, is somebody chairing this or do you want to You are on, you do it. Okay, you had your hand up first, oh, your second, okay. and your third. So, and students, think about, don't leave it to these guys. So, um, one way in which, so for example, the Great Depression is interpreted is that this is an unregulated capitalism that um, went off the rails and that all these governments like the FDR government with the New Deal came to capitalism's rescue and saved it from itself. And that in the absence of a state capable of regulating capitalism in that manner and a set of social movements that have the power to counter, counteract the power of capital, in the absence of that sort of thing, capitalism, capitalists and capitalism is its own worst enemy, that it will eventually destroy itself, so to speak. Um, so in this current, I mean, how do you react to that, especially in light of what you've said in this current scenario in which there is no movement, especially a labor movement, that has that kind of power to counteract the power of capital, and that states are instead in service to capital in the ways in which capital wants to act in its own short-term interest. Um, so is that wrong then to think of capitalism as, I mean it goes to this question too of, you know, you're emphasizing contradictions. So one way to think about contradictions is that it's, it's in something internal, intrinsic to the system itself and of such a significant character that it will do itself in. Or contradictions, and it sounds like the kinds of the ones you were listing were ones that are not of that character. They're ones that are totally manageable. They're not of the sort that are inherent in the system that will ultimately, you know, lead to its demise. So, Good. I don't know if that's a coherent question, but no, it's, it's it's five coherent questions. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. 
Um, why don't we take a few? Is that okay? Yeah. Or would you rather I no. answer? Whatever you like. Go ahead. Um, I'm wondering whose interest is served by, you said that um, a lot of people say that um, it's in decline. So where does that come from and what purpose does that serve anyway to say that capitalism is in decline? Okay. Good. That's a fabulous talk. I mean, putting these pieces together, it's really, I just want to express my appreciation for it. Um, one feature of the current situation that I don't think is given enough weight, there's often a lot of comparisons with the 30s that are made. But we are just an unbelievably rich society now. There's a difference between instability in an extremely rich environment from instability that occurs in much less wealthy <laughs> environments. Um, if, you, if you really look at um, people's living standards rather than taking you know, per capita GDP or per capita wages, and look at the vector of things that people consume and how that has changed over the last 30 years, there's no stagnation at the median. That is, the typical person now consumes way more stuff than they did 30 years ago. Of course, there's a segment of the population that really is suffering, that has actually had a decline in real standards of living. But if you actually look at, you make the list, you know, what percentage of people have uh, indoor plumbing? What percentage of people have an air conditioner? What percent, you just make any list. And because those things have gotten so cheap because of productivity increases and globalization, the median standard of living in, in, you know, in, in, not in money terms, but in what you consume, and you combine that with declining per capita uh, family size, you know, so it's kind of the denominator and, and households change. So the fact of the matter is we've had stagnant wages but not stagnant living standards. And then, even at the median, and then if you look over the life course, if you look at the ratio between what an average person who's 55 today consumes compared to when they were 30, you know, 25 years, the, the life course change, there you get the, the slope there, even in money terms, hasn't declined. Uh, the average 55-year-old earns about 1.8 times what they earned when they were 30 today, uh, whereas uh, 25 years ago it was about 1.6 times what they earned 25 years ago for 50. So all I'm saying is that in the context of a really rich society that is tapped into this global uh, cheap labor, lower, uh, high productivity regimes. It's a, it's a way more complicated story about why people aren't in the streets revolting. Yeah. They may feel insecure. I think insecurity has increased. But it's not quite the same as the intensity of suffering. Yeah, I think that's very important. It, it's, it, it's also important in relation to thinking about the environment. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Which I didn't raise because I'm not sure it's about American decline, it's about, it's about capitalism. So let me just start with Eric's points and just a few thoughts on them. Uh, one is that when the concessions period uh, began, uh, workers were quite militant about lowering their expectations. But they did. And part of the reason that they did is they actually <coughs> recognized in the union sector how much they had gained through the 50s and 60s into the 70s. And they were quite ready to give up something to maintain most of it. So it did reflect the fact that there were those past gains. And uh, in terms of living standards uh, right now, I mean, you know, in terms of how much there is around, I mean, productivity in, in manufacturing in the 80s and 90s actually grew faster than in the golden age. Uh, when people think that manufacturing is disappearing, I don't know what the number is. I think, I think in real terms it's something like three, at least twice as much, but I think it's closer to three times as much value added in manufacturing uh, than there was in 1950. The difference is uh, uh, there's, there's the decline in, in uh, manufacturing workers. So in terms of what Eric's raising about uh, people having more stuff, yeah, I think where people are really feeling it is uh, families have more stuff partly because there's two earners, which puts a lot of pressure 
on people into, you know, in terms of childcare and doing the daily stuff. Uh, workloads almost everywhere are incredibly worse than they were 30 years ago. Uh, whether you're looking in the private sector uh, workloads or whether you're looking in the public sector, the, you know, the way they're, they, they can save more money by cutting back on the number of workers than trying to get concessions from the existing number of workers. So I think, I think, I think, yeah, I think the measures of that, I think you're quite right, right, more so than in material terms, other than for the people who are in poverty, you see that expressed in terms of the narrowing of their lives, the, uh, the daily pressures, the insecurity, uh, the pressures at work. Um, in terms of the 30s, one of the things that strikes me is that uh, the, the last time we had a crisis as deep as this, the financial crisis, was in the 30s. In the 30s, unions actually invented new forms of organization, essentially. They're, they're around, but they essentially moved to uh, industrial unions, they moved to uh, away from the, the focus on craft-based unions, the unions that were egalitarian in terms of gender and race, uh, skills. Uh, they developed new forms of democracy in terms of steward systems. Uh, they introduced new tactics in terms of the Wildcats. When this crisis hit, it didn't come out of the clear blue. It came out of unions having been kicked around for a long time before that. And yet there's been almost no discussion of new structures. I, I don't see the labor movement spending a lot of time uh, on new structures. We can talk about some of them, which seem to be happening. I'm not sure how new they are. But I don't see a lot, you know, when you look at something like Walmart's, the idea is people want to get a union like other unions exist. I don't see much uh, of a discussion on new forms of organizations, whether they're new kinds of assemblies regionally or socialist parties, or even a serious discussion of why is it that unions can't even function as defensive organizations anymore. So there's another thing going on with the 30s. And uh, the other thing is, you know, the main difference in the 30s is this presence of a left. I think this is critical. Which, I don't know if I've completely answered your question, because I think I basically agree with you. Uh, I want to talk about this question of regulation, because I think it's a really important theoretical question. Uh, one thing is that there, uh, there are some things that happen that a stronger labor movement would actually mean positive things for capital. Like, you know, the head of the central bank in Japan is worried that corporations aren't raising wages. It's begging corporations to raise wages. Well, that's, there's a contradiction there. The weakness of labor everywhere has become a problem in terms of austerity and stimulus. Uh, the collapse of infrastructure has to do with, I think, the weakness of labor. You know, all kinds of businessmen might say, uh, infrastructure is a mess. We need decent infrastructure just for roads to function and everything else. But uh, for that to happen might mean increasing their taxes, which they don't want. Uh, so I, I, think, I think a strong labor movement would also deal with that. But having said that, two main points, I guess, that I would make. Uh, one is that I don't think that there is anything automatic about an inherent contradiction that undermines the system. I think there are contradictions that emerge, and then the question is, can you cope with them or not? And you have space to cope with them. You know, if you have a contradiction because wages are too high and you can lower them, it's not a contradiction. Uh, so I, I don't think that there are inherent contradictions, and I, I don't think that is sustained uh, historically. Um, and the point about regulated capitalism is that it is regulated. I think that's the main thing I would challenge. Neoliberalism isn't about a deregulated capitalism. The state plays more of a role. You know, with globalization, multinational corporations don't bypass states. They depend on more states than they ever did before. They, especially the, the American state. They depend, on, they depend on each state guaranteeing their property rights. Each state creating conditions in which they can make pro uh, profits. There's a lot of regulation of labor going on. Some of it by taking something away, but some of it by outlawing certain things that could be done. So they're regulating labor. Uh, they've been great at regulating free trade and enforcing it. Uh, you want under, you know, if Canada has cheaper drugs and somebody wants to import it because they say, well, that's free trade, that's the free market. The answer is no. There's limits on what 
on, on what you can do. Uh, if you have environmental standards, the argument is one. It's undermining principles of free trade and your property rights because you're posing. So there's, there is a lot of new institutions about regulating uh, labor, social relations. Uh, you know, the regulation of social movements in Canada is increasing. They're auditing every social movement to see what they do with their funds. And I imagine your institute might be facing this kind of a thing too. Uh, so the state hasn't retreated. It's just there's been a restructuring of the state in terms of what it does and what it doesn't do. When uh, we, there was a right-wing government elected in the mid-90s, I, I remember two of the things that it did immediately. This was all the rhetoric about we have to get the state out of the economy, out of society, and everything else. First thing they did is they set up a boot camp for teenagers that they were worried about. Don't let them hang out in the streets. They're going to have a boot camp for them, which basically is like, uh, I don't know what you call it now. They, they put them into camps where they did labor and they were disciplined, like as if they were in the army. And uh, in the school system, they got rid of parent-teachers organizations because that was actually a way of mobilizing or something. And they centralized everything into the Department of Education. And they actually checked each curriculum to see whether they had words in it like solidarity. Which remains. So, so state is active. And that's without talking about finance. When you actually take a look at finance, finance is the most regulated sector of the American economy. Uh, finance is unbelievably regulated. Right now they're, you know, they're increasing the number of people who go into each bank and assess whether it's likely to fail or not. They're developing that kind of a capacity. It might bother a particular bank, but it's in the interest of the system to do this. So I'd argue that there's actually more regulation. Uh, no, I don't know. I shouldn't say more. There's a lot of regulation. Re regulation. Yeah, it's a different kind of regulation that's happening. Uh, um, and, and, and I guess the main question about the difference between the 30s and now is that, yes, there's a lot of legitimation through consumer goods that people have. <clears throat> that we shouldn't underestimate. People do feel like they have a lot at stake, they have a lot to lose in that, and that they would risk that. So uh, I, I've always thought it was a mistake of the left to always support economic militancy in terms of anybody who wants a higher wage in terms of having more is necessarily a good idea. Might be a good idea for some people, uh, not a good idea for other people. If we really want to mobilize people, it's going to have to be around wanting things to be different rather than uh, just more. But the, the main lesson from the 30s is the threat of socialists, communists, workers in motion, workers as agents, uh, that leads the state to say, how do we save the system? And right now, uh, you know, it's kind of like a shrug. Who's actually uh, threatening the system? Um, and I just, just uh, one of the questions, somebody raised the question of w why are people emphasize the decline? Well, first of all, some people believe it. You know, some people, you know, take a look at the situation and they say, hey, things aren't as good as they were before. There's the threat of China. Uh, the economy is not growing as fast as it was in the 50s. And they identify that as decline. And according to some measures, it might be, but I don't think that's a, a serious way of thinking about it then the establishment always has a reason to worry about whether things are fine and whether they have to get tougher or make changes or it, you know, invite the state in to do certain things. Uh, so the establishment, if you read Fortune and Forbes, you'll find all kinds of arguments. Uh, they're divided, but there'll be all kinds of arguments about uh, things are going to hell in a handbasket and we have to discipline workers to work harder or whatever. So the establishment's got an interest. I'm critical of the left that thinks that arguing that there is decline is somehow strengthening us ideologically and politically. And I don't think it does. You know, if you want to challenge capitalism, you have to, you have to challenge what capitalism is. You know, otherwise you're into, you know, what? Capitalism's in decline, we want it not to be in decline, so we have more of it? <laughs> you know, somebody said, I was on a panel with Doug Henwood, you know, apropos what you said, and uh, somebody was arguing for stimulus. And he said, if you hate capitalism so much, why do you want more of it? <laughs> And, you know, it's a question that should be asked. Yeah, no, this is this has really helped me a lot. I just to try to understand something that seems so so complicated. I, I wonder, how, what is your perspective on the question of 
how race intersects with all of this because you know in terms of like who's feeling it and who's not you know the wealth gap now is just exacerbated access to higher education mass incarceration you know the decline of our schools and our public service sectors uh, even how it's played out within the union movement you know the really the dramatic loss of black union workers and all that how do you see that here but also i think in terms of like social movements yeah that could potentially be pose a real challenge yeah hmm. Uh, let me try to answer that theoretically and maybe get into some trouble and then practically, which I hope uh, makes more sense. I, I mean, I guess theoretically, um, uh, when you look at the working class, uh, you know, when you look at it in the end, as soon as you make it concrete, what is the working class, you immediately have to talk about race, class, a uh, race, gender, age uh, differences. There's, there's no working class that doesn't have those dimensions to it. Otherwise, you're just talking about it as a category. In any concrete sense, it, it, it's always constructed that way. And therefore, to talk about unifying it, uh, you have to look at this historically. So in the question of the US, you have to you know, look at slavery. And without that, you just can't understand the formation of the working class. You have to look at yeah, you know, the relationships uh, to Latin America in terms of understanding questions of immigration and colonialism. Uh, so, so, so you can't understand it without those concrete historical uh, categories. The annexation uh, of the Southwest. Pardon me? The annexation of the Southwest. Yeah, I mean, you have, you have to look at, yeah, that's right. I mean, you have to look at the complete history uh, to understand it. Uh, then if you're trying to, to make make this into a cohesive social force, I think that's where class comes in uh, in very important ways. Not to obscure what class actually includes, but to say, this is what actually unifies us. There's all these, di there's all these different oppressions that we have. This is what unifies us. That we have a particular relationship to capitalism, to employers, and it's around that relationship we have to struggle. And in struggling to build that class, I think one of the concepts we have to have is uh, active equality. So it's not just saying, I don't care whether you're a black worker or a white worker, it's saying that if you're feeling particular oppressions as a black worker or as a Latino worker, and I'm asking you to be unified with me, mm -hmm. I have to actively work for your equality within our structures and in I'm your struggles. Cop shoot you down with no consequences. Yeah. Yeah, so, 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 you know, the working class has to actively say, yeah, if we want to talk about class as a cohesive unifying force, it has to be an active engagement with those kinds of oppressions. So when you look at the question of education that you raised, look at almost any statistic. If you look at the statistics in terms of uh, blacks, you find that it's incredible, the, the inequality. Uh, now, one thing I would say is it's not just a race question, it's specific it's not homogeneous. What happened, Latinos, Asians, and blacks are not a homogeneous category. And in Canada, blacks aren't a homogeneous category. You've got to talk, you know, it's different whether you're talking about Jamaican blacks, American blacks, Somali blacks. So these aren't homogeneous categories. Uh, when you look at the measures of inequality, uh, if you're looking at gross measures, then Asian average income is higher than white. If you're looking at blacks, it's remarkable how inequality unequally are. So then the question is, strategically, how do you want to fight that? So you can fight it by saying, if we're fighting around education, blacks are the most oppressed, and mobilizing blacks around the fact that they're most oppressed. The danger is that you have a politics that's ghettoized, that blacks will get angry uh, because of the most oppressed, but there's no mechanism for winning this fight because you're isolating it to them. Whereas if you're fighting, I'm taking, you know, this is an argument that Adolf Fried has made. If you're fighting for the fact of uh, a decent education, a universally good education for everybody, in a serious way, not in a superficial way, but really, which means everybody really has access to a decent education, then you're inevitably going to help those people who are especially oppressed. So it's not trying to be blind on the question, but it's trying to actually think strategically about recognizing what the statistics say but saying that the key strategic thing is how do we create a broad alliance uh, across race and, you know, with whites and uh, blacks, et cetera. 
But why wouldn't, uh, why would special demands not be a demand of the whole working class? For example, generally, you know, voting, protecting voting rights. Whites absolutely. are not, a absolutely. generally, their voting rights yeah, are no, not. No, no, absolutely. And when, when I say. But to see that as something that's, or, or full rights for immigrant yeah, workers. I, I, look, I, I, you know, when, when I say class. that uh, if the working class is going to build real coherence and unity, then it has to have a, a, an active, you know, if it says, look, we're all equal. If that's the line, we're all equal, uh, then it has to demonstrate that. Well, we're not all equal. No, no, that's my point. Yeah. It has to demonstrate that by fighting for your equality. A prime demand has to, in fact, be about, you know, as far as immigrants in Canada are concerned, that they're good enough to bring to this country to exploit. They have to have completely equal status with workers. Uh, uh, if there is, you know, denial of, uh, you know, voting rights, Absolutely. If you're going to be equal to other workers, you absolutely have to have that. I agree with you. Uh, Somebody okay. must have liked what you said. Got some marks. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, a really interesting talk. Um, I have two questions, uh, and they sort of go at like two, I think, different aspects of your talk. One is um, about um, American empire and global capitalism, um, and to what extent there is a bit of a tension between these two. Um, because in some of the examples you gave, like I, I think the, um, the, the quotation about Vietnam, where you know, the, the US lost, but global capitalism won, that seems to suggest that there's, there's a potential tension there. That's, so that's the, the, the first question, is sort of teasing out that, that, that relationship. The second um, is, um, I think, which sort of picks up on the other more strategic, strategic dimension of your talk, and that is the, the question of the working class. Um, because I think one of the corollaries of um, your talk is it really says something about how we should think about working class movements globally. Um, because one of the things that seems to be happening in this new phase of, 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 of global capitalism is a kind of um, a decline of, say, third world movements and so on. But at the same time, it seemed like one of the uh, one of the the things you were saying was that if you think about the organic composition of capital, um, so the relationship between constant and variable capital, that seems to be very unevenly constituted. So that what might be happening is in the third world, you have much more actual variable capital, and so therefore a larger pro proletariat. So what does that mean in terms of like, uh, you know, thinking about uh, a, a transformation of capitalism based on a working class movement in relation to something like, like third worldism in, in the current situation? Great question. Uh, I'm gonna answer it, unless somebody wanna jump in quickly, otherwise I'm gonna answer this because it raises a, a, a few things. Um, so, so first of all, on, on this question of is there a tension between the, you know, the American state as a state of its own social formation and taking on this responsibility uh, for global capitalism, and the answer is yes. Of course. Uh, first of all, it's actually a burden to do this. I mean, it means that you take on, you know, the costs of the military, you take on the costs of your soldiers dying. Uh, so, so it's it, it, it can be a burden. It's not like. Uh, it's, it's just all these great things that you can do because you've got finance coming in. And then it is a contradiction in terms of uh, having to cope with social forces at home at the same time. Now, I think what has happened is that what happened after the war, what happened immediately after the war, was for the US to actually integrate Europe and to create a liberal capitalism in Europe. Uh, it had to come to terms with its own working class. You had to create amongst its own working class a sense of productivism. In other words, we're not gonna challenge the flow of capital. We're gonna sit, not gonna say multinational corporations can't move. We're not gonna challenge free trade. You can do what you want with production, as long as we can share in some of the benefits. And that model of unionism was essentially spread to Europe. And it meant the defeat of the left in Europe as well. So coming to terms with its own working class was critical to building this empire. So there's always this tension, and it continues. You know, if 
if the American state decided, geez, we've got potential revolutions all over Latin America, and we better triple our aid. Well, it has to deal with what if nobody wants to increase their taxes to do this. So it's always got that tension. And it's quite remarkable. And, and I think that's one of the reasons for why there's more pressure on the work American working class than there are on working classes elsewhere. They really need to have complete com control over them not being a barrier. That, that's a necessity in the US. It's not just a bonus. So, you know, so it is a problem. And, and right now, those contradictions and tensions are only coming from the right. It's from a Congress who doesn't want them to do, do certain kinds of internationalist things. It's not coming from labor. If it was coming from labor, there might be much more serious contradictions. OK, that's one question. This other question raises crucial questions about, again, how we think of the state in terms of what you were raising about uh, regulation. Uh, oh, I should say, uh, let me just throw in one thing quickly, and then I'll get to this question of the state. Uh, with global capitalism, you don't have a, uh, a global capitalism that is homogeneous. What you still have is one that, you know, we used to think of the global south as that's the place where they don't do manufacturing and which imports capital. Well, that kind of gets reversed. Then what does that mean? Well, first of all, you still have a hierarchies. It's still hierarchies for the reason that you raised in terms of where the high tech stuff is, where the stuff with higher organic capital is raised. So it's still a world that's very uneven. Um, and where the, you know, the growing proletariat is in the, is in the global south. Although that's, you know, that's, a, that's a global proletariat, not just because of what's happening with capital, but because they're coming off the farm to become workers, whether they worked in services or manufacturing. OK, now the, the, this big question of uh, what does this mean for, I, I take it this is where you're going. What does it mean for when we talk about uh, the working class's agency? And what's the site of struggle? Is the site of struggle the international, or is it the national? And uh, the argument I make, and the argument we make in the book, is that we have to understand that the making of global capitalism still happens through states. It doesn't happen in this abstract world of just corporations floating around. It happens through states. States that set certain kinds of conditions, reproduce certain kinds of social relations, create the institutions that make capitalism work. People always thought that there's a contradiction between a global capitalism and nation states. The way that that contradiction was resolved was by nation states becoming internationalized in the sense of we're going to take care of creating the conditions for global accumulation within our territory. In Canada, it means that Canadian government takes care of General Motors. It doesn't matter whether it's American or not. But within the Canadian territory, they do what they need to do in terms of labor relations, subsidies, roads to support General Motors. So states are fundamentally important, which means that if we want to change things, it isn't by trying to change the IMF or the World Bank that we're going to change things. Uh, they reflect social relations within states. That still, is, that still is true very much in Europe. I mean, you know, what happens in Europe still depends very much on what's happening in Germany or what's happening in Greece. So states are still the fundamental site of struggle. And the other thing is that the, the struggles that we face now are increasingly political. So again, speaking from a Canadian perspective, we used to look to uniting with the Americans to do so we'd have some strength against General Motors. But right now, collective bargaining isn't where, what affects things. What affects things most has been exchange rates. Uh, you know, we had things like wage controls, uh, you know, austerity policies, uh, right to work legislation. It's been very political things. And to fight political things, you have to build a class against that state. So that also pushes you into operating at the state level. The question of where internationalism comes in, uh, I'm giving a long answer, but I, I think this is important, is that you know, in the 70s, when I came to the union, a big line was we had to have international unions. Things are becoming global. We have to have, in the auto industry, we're fighting, fighting General Motors in Mexico, and so why don't we have an international union? Well, what that really meant was, A, this was kind of at the peak when bargaining was starting to come to its limits, and the political questions were emerging, that people were saying you had to be more of a business unionist. Second of all, it meant that if we linked up with Mexico to raise their wages, in Mexico, the problem was, wasn't the low wages of auto workers. They were already way above the norm. The problem was how isolated they were becoming from the norm. The problem was building the class in Mexico. 
So what you were really doing with international unionism, since this was a business unionism, was you were internationalizing business unionism. So it wasn't the answer. So that isn't an answer. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, I mean, there's all the obvious things that you can do. There's a war in Iraq, you protest. Somebody's threatening to invade uh, Venezuela, you, you, you argue about, you know, th their sovereignty. There's a lot of very modest things that can be done that aren't being done in terms of exchanging information. Uh, the, the unions in the, in the global north have terrific databases on health and safety and a lot of expertise. This could really help in the global south, and partly because when you deal with health and safety, it's always a very local thing. It's a way of really building a local base. It isn't something that somebody can centrally bargain. So, you know, there's those kinds of things to do. We've gone through all kinds of struggles around race and gender, with some positive things happening. In a lot of places in the global south, that's just starting. We've got a role to play in terms of talking about, and we've been doing that in, in, south, uh, in south Africa. You know, when there's a specific struggle in a country, like they're trying to break a union in Mexico, yeah, we should get involved. But I don't think those things require formalizing things like international unions. Uh, I think it requires, the most important thing it requires is struggling in your own country. If you're not struggling in your own country, you're undermining everybody. If American workers are giving up on work time, as they did after the 80s, it undercut the German workers who were fighting for it. So struggling in your own country creates space for struggles elsewhere. They can't threaten to move. Uh, and you know you start ratcheting things up rather than reducing them. So, so I don't think it's a question of formalizing international trade unionism. I think it's a question of how do you struggle, always with an international sensibility, because you're always, if you believe in social justice, it's got to be universalized. But I don't think there's a, you know, there's no, you know, if we're not strong here, what can we really do for Chinese workers or Brazilian workers? W what can we do? You know, it's an environmental question, and we say, gee, we should give them all our technology. You can't give it to them if you don't control it. You know, if you don't control your state and you don't control corporations, you know, you can't do anything unless you actually have some power here. Okay. Uh, do you mind if I go to a couple of students? No. Okay. Just we'll a reminder that we're going to try to end at 5.30. But okay. But we'll th take... Thursday is an open forum for continuing all of this discussion. Okay. I'll take you two questions. Go. Uh, yes, so when discussing uh, the uh, illusion of the decline of industry, such as the auto industry, uh, your answer to this was that decline was primarily confused with restructuring. I was wondering if you could be a bit more specific or elaborate on what you mean by restructuring. Uh, I'll take this question, and then I'll try to answer them both quickly. I guess my, my question is a little less grounded in political science, but it came to mind when you were talking about uh, material base. Um, the question is, how might the ecological implications of rising global capitalism be addressed at an empire-wide level? <laughs> um, OK, let me start with uh, the restructuring. Uh, uh, if, if you looked at the United States and read the newspapers, what you would get is every time a plant closed, you'd see a story of another community devastated. So there was a student, uh, Nicole Asha, she actually went through all the data and she tried to find where there was expansions, which normally weren't stories, or where there were new openings. And what she found was, for the U.S. as a whole, at this moment in time when everybody was talking about the auto industry disappearing, there were all kinds of closures, but there were all, also all kinds of openings. And when you looked at that, what you would find is that, uh, yeah, Detroit was losing plants, but a lot of the plants were opening in rural areas. So there was a shift from urban uh, to rural, and there was a massive shift to the American South. And you know, that part of the story of American decline is fundamental. You know, you, you, you drive through the Midwest, and you go through Detroit, and you go through parts of Michigan, and, you know, this is an empire. But what you have to remember is Texas and Carolina, you know, and the rest of you, and, you know, Kentucky and Georgia, where, where our plants are. So you can actually track the investments, and there's been massive investments 
in the United States, and where they used to import a lot of the vehicles from, the, uh, from uh, Germany and Japan, that shifted to actually the investments being made in the US. So you've got that restructuring. And alongside that restructuring, you've got the parts industry. Um, your question, which I take to be, yeah, how do you fight around the environment uh, in the context of a global empire? Good question. Uh, there's, there's actually a session tomorrow on uh, Naomi Klein's book, which we're going to address some of that. But um, I, I, you know, to me, what makes that question so difficult, and what we have to uh, address is, some people think that you can address it by scaring the shit out of people, and if you scare the shit out of them, they all become environmentalists, and that doesn't happen. People are just as likely to throw their hands up in the air and say, let's go party. Uh, and other people think that you can only address this if you refuse to. I, I've been criticized, for example, for uh, linking the environment to other social issues. You know, my argument is if you, no, I mean in the sense that my argument is if you can't defeat neoliberalism, I don't think you can do, you win on the environmental issue. And people have said that, well, you're, when you raise all the other issues, you're obscuring the environmental issue. And I think that's also a mistake. I don't think that you can move and mobilize people unless you actually have a, a vision and you're mobilizing them about a lot of aspects of their lives. And this is one of them that's absolutely integrated into everything. Not just another issue, it's, you know, the environment is absolutely crucial, but I think that that's the other thing. And the final thing I'd say is, I, you know, there are things that you can do about the environment. You know, there are things that you can fix by fighting and protesting. Uh, you know, the, the uh, the, the largest institution in the world doing research on the environment is the American Defense Department. They're doing more than anybody else because objectively, they're finding it incredibly costly to get oil to where they need it. It's, it's risky. You need all the security systems to get it. So they're trying to find alternatives. So they've invested more than any institution in the world in doing it. So maybe, you know, there will be spin-offs and there will be some things that improve the environment. But if you're serious about thinking about the environment, then you have to talk about capitalism. You have to talk about how do you challenge capitalism. As soon as you start talking about how do you end capitalism, you can't escape the fact that this will take a long time. There's no way that we can build the capacities out of the clear blue to end capitalism, to have another vision, and to change people's attitudes about what they value in life. Unless they're engaged in all kinds of struggles that they go through and they decide, hey, there's more important things to me than, you know, one particular electronic gadget, people won't say, okay, I think we should consume less so that the third world can consume more. That, that's not going to come from you giving an argument to people until they've been through all kinds of struggles and their culture has changed. So you have the contradiction that environmentalists say, unless we fix the world in a couple of weeks, we're all finished. And somebody says, well, if, if you actually have to change, get rid of capitalism to do that, that can't take, you know, you're talking about so these three optimistically <laughs> generations. So, so, you know, we do have to deal with this. We have to honestly deal with this. This question of time is, is a really difficult one. We just have to deal with it. Okay. Well,